Cramwell Hair Tonic and Cramwell Shampoo presents The New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Now, once again, it's time to keep that weekly appointment with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. As usual, you're punctual to the minute. Pull up a chair and make yourself comfortable. Thank you. That's it. I see that you have the old black tin dispatch box out again, Dr. Watson. I deduce that you're going over some of your notes on tonight's case. Elementary, my dear boy. Among the records, I came across some notes of some cases that I'd almost forgotten. The shocking death of Crosby the Banker, the Adeltine tragedy, and some data on the unusual contents of the ancient British pharaoh. Those stories sound pretty intriguing, Dr. Watson. I shall tell them to you some other evening, Mr. Bell. Tonight, I'm going to recount an adventure that took place in the heart of the beautiful English countryside. I call it The Adventure of the Tolling Bell. Well, that story began in the small country village of Comforth. Holmes had recently brought to a successful conclusion the affair of the barrow and furnished wheelchair motors. And we decided a few days' rest in nearby Comforth would do us good before returning to our arduous life on Baker Street. We were staying in a small but comfortable inn. Only on the morning of the third day, I remember, Holmes and I were in our bedrooms waiting for the two essentials without which an English country gentleman could not start his day. An early morning cup of tea and a jug of hot water for shaving. As we sat there at the open window, a nearby church bell was tolling a funeral now. There must be a funeral in the village, Holmes. An astonishing deduction, Watson. There's no need to make fun of me. Impressing sound, isn't it? I suppose so. Has it ever occurred to you, Watson, that the history of bells is full of romantic interest? Well, I can't say I've thought much about it. Almost every historical event has been accompanied by the sound of bells. They summoned soldiers to arms, as well as Christians to church. They sounded the alarm in the 52 Molten Invasion, and many a bloody chapter in history has been rung in and out by bells. Well, you seem to be a mind of information on this subject. Yes, Watson, it's a fascinating subject. Come in, come in. Good morning, my dear. Pardon me, gentlemen. I brought your tea and your shaving water. Mrs. Michael says that your breakfast will be ready in half an hour. Splendid, Mary. Oh, a uh, Mary, the church bell's tolling a funeral now. Do you know who's being buried? <laughs> that I do, sir. I wish it was me. It will be my turn soon. Poor little thing. I wonder what's the matter with her. I have no idea. Perhaps her father and mother just died. Or a young man, yes. I bet that's it. She's a pretty girl. She'd obviously been crying when someone came, when she came in. Perhaps that's her fiancé they're burying now? Watson, you have the sentimental imagination of the true storyteller. But we've come here for a holiday. We must give the imagination a rest too. So drink your tea, move your whiskers, and we'll go downstairs and investigate those kippers. You like your kipples, gentlemen? Excellent, Mrs. Mackle. Excellent. Never eaten better. Yes, indeed. By the way, Mrs. Mickle, we heard the funeral about tolling earlier on. Do you know who's being buried? Yes, yes, I do. Two souls were being buried, and one of them was a murderer. A murderer? In this peaceful village? What happened, Mr. Mickle? Mrs. Mickle? Oh, um, Threadgold, the corn merchant, found out his wife had been gallivanting around with a young fellow from Bolton. Cut her throat, he did, and then hanged himself. More tea. Thank you. Shocking. So the peaceful countryside is not as peaceful as it's made out to be, Holmes. Thank that I frequently had occasion to point out to you, Watson. Has the morning post arrived yet, Mrs. Mickle? Here comes old Gilly up the path with it now. I'll see if he's got anything for you. A murder? What do you make of it, Holmes? What is there to make of it, Watson? A jealous husband murders a faithless wife and then commits suicide. A tragic story, but a simple one. Top of the morning to you, gentlemen. Good morning, Gillian. Any letters for me today? Hi, Mr. Holmes. Two letters. One of them's got some newspaper clippings in it, I think. And you got a postcard from a Mr. Lestrade? 
He wants you back in London bad, Mr. Holmes. There you are. Pardon myself, Gilly. You've been reading Mr. Holmes' private correspondence. Bless your heart, Dr. Watson. If I didn't read other people's correspondence, how'd I know what's going on in the village? Hmm. You were right, Gilly. It is newspaper killing clippings. And by the way, you heard about the murder of Mrs. Threadgold, I suppose. Heard about it. I told the bell this, fun this morning at the funeral. Did you say that you're the bell ringer as well as the postman? Bless your heart, yes, Doctor. President of the Choral Society, too, as well as being on the Paris Council. You're a busy man, Gillian. That I am, sir. Take this afternoon now. I'm to ring those bells again. Not another funeral, surely? No, sir. A wedding this time. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Look, St. Perry is marrying the Slater girl. And you might say I'm responsible for bringing them together. I got some of the letters mixed up I did. Then they looked each other up to exchange them, and presto, before you know what's happening, they're getting married. Regular Cupid, you might say I am. Be off with you, Gilly. Other people want their letters. Mr. Holmes doesn't want his cabbage spoiled with your idle chatter. All right, Mrs. Crab Apples and Vinegar. Hi. One of these fine days, you'll smile, and the world will come to an end. Good day, gentlemen. Talk to him, old busybody he is. Oh, Mr. Holmes, Mrs. Lockman, Lockland's in the hall. The poor lady is most anxious to talk to you. Mrs. Lockland? She has the same struggle in the high street. Her only son ran away a few months back. I think that's what she wants to speak to you about. Oh, but your friend's here for a rest, Mrs. Lockland. I told her that, Doctor, but she won't go away without seeing Mr. Holmes. Oh, very well. Ask her to come in, please, Mrs. Mickle. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Oh, I do bother to see her, Holmes. Sounds like a trivial matter. The disappearance of an only son can never be a trivial matter. Well, I meant trivial for you, not for her. This is Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson, dear. Thank you, Amy. Good morning, sirs. Good morning. Good morning. Please sit down, Mrs. Lackland. That's it. Now, what's the trouble? It's Tom, sir. My only son. He left me four months ago, and I've not seen a hair nor a night of him since. And you've had no message from him since he left? Not one word. I'm far out of my mind, sir. Have you any idea of his reason for leaving the village, Mrs. Lackland? No, sir. He was a good boy, and he worked hard. And he didn't fool around with those slippery jibbity girls in the village. I think he's one of the foul play gentlemen, and I want you to find out about him for me, Mr. Holmes. I've heard say in the village that you're the greatest detective in England. Mrs. Lackland, I'd be glad to help you, but you've given me no clues to work with. I'm afraid that I... If it's money you want, I've got twenty pounds in my holster savings. It's all yours if you can bring my Tommy home to me, or at least tell me he's safe. Mrs. Lackland, I wouldn't dream of accepting a fee. However, I shall give your problem some thought. If I arrive at any conclusions, I'll get in touch with you at once. God bless you, Mr. Holmes. Good morning to you, sirs. Good day. Good morning, Mrs. Lackland. Poor old thing. I don't see how you can help her, Holmes. Nor do I, at the moment. But a young man who has grown up in a small village like this may have led a life that his mother is totally unaware of. You said that you have to work on one of your stories today, Watson? Yes. I have a letter from the editor of the Strand magazine yesterday, requesting a manuscript as soon as possible. Splendid. Then you must stay at the inn and work on your latest masterpiece, while I scour the village to see what may be found out about the missing young man. There you are, Holmes. I was beginning to think you got lost. Hello, Watson. I trust you had a profitable session with pen and paper. I got about half a chapter. I would have done more if it hadn't been for those infernal bells. At that wedding ceremony that the worthy Gillian told us about this morning. Oh, I'm tired. What did you find out about Mrs. Lachlan's song? Among other things, she had a secret love life unknown to his mother, and the object of his affections was none other than the maid who brought us our tea this morning. Mary? Did you talk to her? No, it's a half day off and I was unable to find her. But I shall question her when she brings us our tea tomorrow morning. Come in, Mary. Oh, Mrs. Mappa. Good morning, gentlemen. Here's your tea and shaving water. Where's Mary this morning? She didn't come to work. Must be ill again. Not a reliable girl. Not a reliable girl. I know better than she ought to be if you ask me. It's no job for me to be carrying hot tea and water upstairs. I hear the village bell tolling for another funeral. Does Conforth have a burial every morning? It's I really don't see how a population can run into it. It's another suicide, sir. 
Another suicide? Good lord. Own John Letterby, the beggar. He was expecting some money from his son in Australia. It never came, and they foreclosed on his shop. And he hanged himself. Will you be wanting a couple of boiled eggs to your breakfast, gentlemen? No, no. I haven't much of an appetite. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. That woman seems absolutely heartless. She almost smacks her lips when she tells us about these tragedies. Yes, Walton, I noticed it. This peaceful village is being to seem strangely sinister to me. And since you have no appetite for breakfast, perhaps you'll join me on a little excursion as soon as you're dressed. Of course. Where are we going? To see the maid, Mary. I'm anxious to talk to her before another funeral bell begins to toll. This must be the cottage home. They said it was the one with honeysuckle over the gate. Yes, and there's Mary sitting on the porch. She's got up. She's coming up to meet us. Good morning, Mary. I'm sorry you're not feeling well. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, why have you come here? Not to ask about my health. Why should a servant go matter to gentlemen like you? Oh, you've misjudged us, my dear. I assure you that- No, Watson. Let's be honest and admit we didn't come here because of our concern for Mary's health. Then why did you come here, sir? Mrs. Lackland asked me to try to find her son, Tom. Tom? Yes, Tom Lackland. I thought you might be able to help me, Marion. If I could help you, Mr. Holmes, I'd be helping myself, too. Here comes Gilly, the postman. Gilly, Gilly, is there a letter for me today? Oh, lass, nothing for you again. There must be. Gilly, there must be there. No, lass, if the letter would come, I would bring it to you as fast as me legs would carry me. You know that. Morning, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. Left some letters for the inn for you, Doctor. You had a letter from a lady. How did you know it was from a lady? Reeked with a smell of violets it did. And it was written in green ink on grey paper, sir. Amazing deduction. That sounds like your young friend from Daedalus, Watson. How did you know about it? I mean, I don't have a young friend from Daedalus, Watson. <laughs> Quite. Gilly, you told another funeral bell today, didn't you? Aye, sir. And the tragic thing it was, all that to be hanged himself because he didn't get money from his son in Australia. I found him, I did. I was the one to cut him down. And right in me post bag was the letter he was waiting for. The letter that would have saved his life. Great Scott. What a ghastly piece of irony. That's it was, sir. That's it was. Well, gentlemen, I must be on my way. Good day. Good day, Mary. Perhaps the letter will arrive tomorrow. No, I'll never hear from Tom. Now he's ashamed of me. That's why he deserted me. Deserted you, Mary? You almost speak as if you were his wife. I am his wife. What? We were married secretly in Rochdale five months ago, come Tuesday. And he never told his mother? He was afraid to. She thought I was beneath him. Tom said he'd go away and get a good job, and then return here and fetch me back with him. He went away all right, but he never came back or sent me a word. When he left, did he give clues to his destination? No hints of any kind, Mary. Wait. He did once say, Mary, I'm going to clear out this puddle and make me fortune, even if I have to bury it. And then he said, bury me fortune? Huh, that's a joke, isn't it? I don't know what he meant by it. I think I do, Mary. Watson, we're taking a short train journey as soon as possible. Oh, where are we going, may I ask? We're going to the town of Bury in search of this young lady's husband. What makes you think Tom might be in Bury, Mr. Holmes? Because the famous fortune cotton mills are in Bury. It would seem possible that when your husband joked of burying his fortune, he was talking of going to the mills there. Wherever well, he's gone, he won't be coming back for me. I know that. Now, 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 now. Don't talk like that, my dear. Remember you have friends, Mrs. Lachlan. <laughs> How much longer is Holmes going to be? He leaves me standing out the factory gate as if I were a blasted coachman. Ah, uh, there he is. There he is. Holmes. Holmes. Hello, Watson. Permit me to introduce you to Mr. Tom Blackland. Tom, this is Dr. Watson. How do you do, Dr. Watson? How do you do? Never mind how I do, fellow me lad. How do you do? Your behavior is absolutely shocking. Shocking? Now what are you talking about? Leaving your dear old mother and deserted your pretty little bride? Because you're ashamed of her? You're a scoundrel, sir. You deserve a good horse whipping, and I have a good mind to give it to you. I don't know what you're talking about, Dr. Watson, but I don't like the word you use. And if it's violence you want, I don't mind telling you that I'm amateur heavyweight champion of the county. You are. Oh, no need to become aggressive. No, let's waste time on being acrimonious, Watson. 
Let's get back to the station as fast as we can. The return of the prodigal is long overdue. We must give them every opportunity to kill the fatted calf. Ah, there is Mary's house. I've been dying to see her. And after this reunion, Tom, I suggest that you both go over and see your mother. I'm sure she'll forgive you. Yes, Mr. Holmes, I'll do that. Perhaps we should have warned her. Your sudden appearance may be something of a shock. I think it is shock Mary can handle. She must be out. The door's locked. Knock again, if you don't mind. She may be asleep. Great heavens! That was a revolver shot. Come on, Watson. Help me break in the door. Now, Dr. Watson, that was a fine place to break off your story. You left me right on the edge of a cliff. Had the young girl shot herself? She shot at herself, Mr. Bell. But fortunately, her last-minute lack of courage had made her shot go wild. Holmes and I and the young bridegroom burst into the house and rescued the smoking revolver from her hand. I must confess, the reunion between the two young lovers was a touching sight. In fact, I felt considerably older than I was as Holmes and I stood there listening to Tom reassure her. Mary, darling, it's all right. I'm here. Oh, Tom, you are. You did come back for me. I thought you never would. I tried to kill myself, but I hadn't the courage. Oh, there, there, Mary. Everything's going to be all right now. It will be, Tom, won't it? Oh, I'm so tired. And now, Tom, I think the time has come to reassure Mary that you did write to her. Of course I did, Mary, darling. I sent you money and told her that I'd be back to take you to Barry as soon as I'd save up enough. You wrote to me, Tom? Twice a week. And I wrote to Mother, too. Then why didn't I get the letters? The answer to that should be obvious, my dear. Gilly the postman deliberately withheld them from you. Gilly? Great heavens! Why? I have my suspicions. Strong suspicions. But I have to get proof. Tell me, Mary, the day before yesterday, Mr. Fred Gordon murdered his wife. Do you know how he learned of her infidelity? Well, I'm not sure, but I heard Mrs. Michael say that it was through some letters that got mixed up. The letters addressed to her were delivered to his office instead of at the house. Gilly again. Precisely. The, surely the whole Talbot pattern begins to take shape, Tom. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I'm going to lay a trap. To spring it, I shall need your assistance. Of course, Mr. Holmes. I'll do anything. Wait here with Mary until darkness falls. Then muffle yourselves up and go to your mother's house. Wait there in hiding and let no outsider see you until you hear from me. Since you two lovebirds have been separated for four months, I don't imagine that will be too unpleasant. Quiet, Walton. You understand, Tom? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Good. Come on, Walton. What's your plan, Holmes? I'll tell you as we go. One thing I can promise you, before the sun is very high tomorrow, I shall free this village from one of the most subtly evil powers I've ever come in contact with. Good morning, Dr. Watson. Mr. Holmes. Good morning, Mrs. Mackle. Good morning. I always said that Mary was a no-good girl, and now she's killed herself. But of course, I had to come to the funeral. That's very cheatable, Mrs. Mackle. I must say, in any case, the vicar says that the poor girl was of unsound mind. Yes, madam, you can't blame her. Well, I'll be getting into the church. Holmes, this farce is beginning to get on my nerves. What you'll be accomplishing by burying an empty coffin? You'll see, old chap. Come on, let's slip into the vestry. This way. Where are we going, Holmes? Up the stairs that lead to the belfry. Here they are. Well, supposing Gilfrey turns nasty, and he finds out we know his secret? Then we must handle him to the best of our ability, Watson. Well, I must say, do not relish the thought of a tussle high in the belfry of a church. The man must be insane. Obviously. That's why his power must be destroyed. This door apparently leads to the belfry. Keep your wits about you, Watson. Good morning, Gilly. Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, you've come to see me at work. That's nice of you. Not offering a company up here. We haven't come to see you at work, Gilly. We know of your diabolical work only too well. Yes, Gilly. We know your secret. What secret's that? You're mad with power, Gilly. You tried to control the destiny of this village. In your position as postman, you thought you had the power to give life and death. 
That's my answer, and it's a great power. Makes a man feel good. Almost like a god, you might say. That's sacrilege, you scramble. You were responsible for the murder of Mrs. Threadgold. I sir, that I was. And for the old man hanging himself. You were responsible for John Letterby's suicide, weren't you? That I was. Letterby tried to vote me off the village council. I see I'd make him pay for it, and I did. Your reign is over, Gilliam. You'll never toll a bell again. There's only, the only one you'll hear will be a prison bell. You can't cuss you, Mr. Holmes. You've got no proof. There's nothing you can do. Don't be too sure. I have enough influence to take your job away. You, you're taking me away from me, bells. I live with these bells. You wouldn't take me away from them. You couldn't live without the power they give you, could you, Gilly? You're trying to destroy me. You're already destroyed, Gilly. Yes, you've already failed. Mary's alive. Uh, alive? With a coffin they're burying down there? It is full of stone. You'll be the laughing stock of the village, Gilly. They're never laughing, Gilly. You can't catch me, Mr. Holmes. I'm the only still. <laughs> He's running up the ladder leading to the bell tower. Come back, Gilly. Come back. He's mad as a hotter. Quite. What's he going to do up there? He might set fire to the steeple. Could make any madness. I'm going to fetch him, Holmes. No, Watson. He drew a knife as he fled. And with that rickety staircase and the narrow opening leading into the bell chamber, you'd never stand a chance. He'd get you on the first ledge. How are we going to get him down? There's only one way. He's in a tiny loft containing his beloved bells. We'll see how much he loves him at close quarters. I doubt even he can stand in his neck and find space. Where's that bell rope? Come down, Gary. Come down from there. Stop! Stop ringing me, Bell! I often see you come down, Gilly. Stop ringing them! I can't stand it! You're making me mad! You are mad, Gilly. Mad with power. Come down here, I say. I'm coming! Great heavens! He hurled himself out of the belfry. Holmes, he hasn't a chance of surviving that fall. I had no intention of causing that unhappy man to jump to his death, Watson. Though I can't help but feel that his poor, demented mind may find a happier oblivion this way, rather than in the confines of an asylum. Yes, you're probably right, Holmes. It's been a shocking case, Watson. Shocking. And once again, it proves the old saying that violence doesn't true recoil upon the violent, and the schemer falls into the pit which he digs for another. <laughs> Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, no, let me see. What's left in here? Next week I'll tell you a rather gruesome story about how Sherlock Holmes saved the life and the sanity of a certain Count Romania. I call it The Adventure of the Car Carpathian Horror. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story. The Golden Pansnay. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steiner. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Crammel Hair Tonic and Crammel Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at this time when Dr. Watson will tell us The Adventure of the Carpathian Hall. <laughs>